Alongside our real life series, we've actually been doing a series this year. We started the year uh, looking at the vision of the church, and then we've been looking at the values of the church. And uh, we're coming towards the end of that year. And so very timely, we now hit the last value of the kind of distinctives, really, that we believe God's called us to as a church. And just to be clear on this vision, our vision is very simple. It's loving Jesus, making him known. Okay? It's simple enough for children to understand. It's significant enough for adults to live by. It's loving Jesus, making him known. But the values are the things that underpin that, really. They are the distinctive kind of principles, the things, the way we build, the things that matter to us in how we live out that vision. And we actually have 10. And uh, I'm going to pick on one of you now to recite all 10. (laughs) That was a lot of nervous laughter. (laughs) Okay. So it's because of Christ, okay? It's, we're Christ-centered, not self-centered. We're passionate, not passive. We're relational, not individualistic. We're grace-filled, not legalistic. We want to be biblical, not worldly. We want to be spirit-filled, not powerless. We want to be apostolic and prophetic, not independent. Each one matters, not just the few. We want to be compassionate, not complacent. We want to be outgoing, reaching out, not inward. And it's that last value that I want to focus on today, to neighbours and nations that we're outgoing, not inward. And I think the best way this morning for us to focus on this is to literally get a spotlight and to look at discipleship. Because I believe this value is found in the core of what disciple, being a true disciple of Jesus Christ, is all about. So can we turn, please, to Matthew chapter 4, And verse 17. And we're picking up the story of Jesus, as told by one, as in the Gospels. He's been baptized, he's been in the wilderness, and it really is the beginning of his public ministry. From that time on, Jesus began to preach Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. And Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. Jesus went throughout throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. And people brought him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. It was another day of ordinary life for these two brothers. They were doing what they'd always done. And in fact, quite likely what their father had done and their previous generations had done. It would have been a family business. They were going fishing. 
And it was into that world that Jesus stepped. And he was to say something that was to change their lives forever. In fact, in this sentence, there's almost like two phrases that we're going to put the spotlight on. The first phrase is this, come follow me. Come follow me. And with that word come, we hear an amazing invitation from Jesus. It's everything we've heard about this morning, just in terms of the prophetic, the words that have been shared with us, that there's a constant theme. You could hear it coming. I've chosen you. I've chosen you. I've chosen you. I invite you. I invite you. Behind all that is this word of Jesus saying, come. Come. He calls them. It starts with Jesus. It doesn't start with them. Interestingly, this it's very different to the rabbis of the time. There were many rabbis in, uh, in, in Israel at that time. And they would go around with their teachings. And people would kind of hook up with them. But it's like the person's decision. I like this rabbi. I will join him. I will follow this one. I will go there. It depended on the person's initiative. Jesus is turning everything around. It starts with him. It's his initiative. It's his call. He says, come. That one word, it takes us right into the big, big story that actually we can read about in Ephesians, that since before the beginning of time, God chose us. What a remarkable statement. Before time, before the creation of the world, before you and I were twinkles in the eye, God chose us. That's grace. Nothing to do with what we do. Jesus enters their world. That's what he does for us. And they were caught, as someone, as a, a scholar has written, these two brothers were caught in the net of God's grace. And it will transform them. In fact, I'm adding, and it will transform many other lives as well. And notice, he comes to them on their ground. He comes to them in that dirty, messy, kind of world of fishing. He steps right where they are. It's how Jesus comes to us. He doesn't wait for us to get cleaned up. He doesn't wait for us to become... He doesn't meet them in the temple. He doesn't give them an appointment in the temple. He steps right into their world. And that's what he does. Come. He calls us. And then he says, follow. Follow me. Everything is changed. The boats, the nets, the fishing, the family, family business. All those things are good things. But they all get change. And the change is this, who or what comes first? It's exactly what Gail brought a bit earlier, you know, that Jesus is inviting us, but what we're we holding on to, that somehow we think looks more attractive, that we think is more valuable, that we think is more precious, what is that in our hand that stops us reaching out to respond to this call of Jesus. It's not that we have to leave our work. It's not that we have to, mind you, some of you might like that idea, okay? But, but it's not that we have to leave our work. It's not that we have to leave our families. No comment on that. But it's, it's not that we have to do the same details of what they do. But the issue is this, and the challenge is the same. Where is your first allegiance? 
follow him. This is discipleship. It's discipleship 101. It's about following. It's a key word, following. Actually, the reality is this. The Bible says we're all born followers. Again, if you kind of were to cross-reference into Ephesians, we read this in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead. In your transgressions and your sins, in which you used to live when you followed, notice that word, the ways of this world, and of the rule of the kingdom of the air. All of us lived among them, and at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. We're born followers. We follow the way of the world. Shockingly, but significantly, we need to hear, we follow the ruler of the prince of the air. We're, we're, we're not blank sheets. We're born followers. We follow the impulses of kind of our flesh and our bodies. That's what we're born into. Jesus calls for a change of allegiance. Follow me. In fact, we're in a world today, aren't we, where actually followings become very trendy. It's what social media thrives on. Okay, if you've got Twitter, you've got Instagram, you're either following or you have followers. You know? And it kind of, the whole thing functions on following. So there's a new understanding of following out there, which basically is this. You follow people you're interested in. You might want to follow their opinions. In fact, there's a birth now of a whole new brand of people called influencers. You know, that use social media to influence society. I read an article about influencers literally a few months ago. The 100 top influencers. I didn't know a single one of them. <laughs> Just think about me. You know, I mean, the mere fact they're out there and the mere fact you don't know, and then you read about the millions that are following them, we're in a world is trendy to follow. There's a trendiness to it. Jesus cuts into that with a different sort of following. It's not about influence. It's not about interest groups. It's not about even Jesus' opinion. It's something more radical than that. Now, we can actually even look at the church. Not only does the world create followers, do you know the church can create followers? The church can send out a message that is this, well, just follow the rules. Come along, be regular in attendance. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, that's the only place I'd add that. This is the only church I'd say that and add that because I know I could be misunderstood. <laughs> Okay, be regular in attendance. If you're a visitor, you can, yeah. Anyway, uh, be regular in attendance. We do care about your health and well-being as well. Um, be regular in your attendance. Hey, give, help out a bit, serve a bit, whatever. Keep yourself out of trouble. Read the Bible a bit. Pray a bit. Go to the midweek meetings a bit. Boom. We've got a church creating rules. That's how many people see Christianity. Jesus cuts through all of that with his call to follow him. He said at the heart of Christianity is not rules, it's relationships. And it's about a relationship with this Jesus who comes us where we are. He calls us out to follow him. And it's about his kingdom. That's why I continue to read that it's not just that we follow a rabbi, that somehow we're fascinated by his teachings and we think, yeah, I, I like that interpretation. I like the, 
I like the emphasis Jesus puts on life. No, it's not that. He's king. He's king. It's about a kingdom. And this is what these early disciples, that's why their lives are being turned inside out. That once I live for that, I now live for him. And that's the challenge for us that God wants to hear. Because without this first call, the second bit doesn't make sense. We're called to follow Jesus. It's Jesus first. He is the king. He's so important. It was counterculture for them. Their culture was family. It was the local community. It was their work. They were part of this fishing community culture. That was their culture. And Jesus turns their culture inside out. It's exactly the same for us. Do you know what our culture is in these days? It's individualism. It's materialism. It's consumerism. It's about personal fulfillment. It's about self-expression. And somehow we can put Jesus into our view of the world and how it should be. We can still make room for Jesus. So we somehow see Jesus filling the spiritual bit of my life, but I carry on as normal. We can see Jesus as just helping out with the problems and the difficult times, a bit like a spiritual RAC man. You call him up, okay, need a bit of help, a bit, a, a bit of a stick, call him out, whatever, and he does that. And then he's grace, he does that. That's wonderful, he does that. He's done that many times with me when I got into scrapes. But it's not just that. It's not just that Jesus helps our spiritual development. It's not suddenly we hit that time in life where we think, okay, well, you know, I, I need to think about, you know, maybe the unseen things, the spiritual things. I think Jesus is safe to explore. Maybe he can help you in my spiritual development. No, 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 no. He's king. He's king. This is where it starts. It's an encounter with the king. Jesus is king. It's Jesus first. It's a challenge, isn't it? We can somehow believe in Jesus and still keep self central to our lives. And yet Jesus, later on in Matthew, he spells out discipleship, kind of a little bit more detail in Matthew 16. He says this, Jesus said to his disciples, they're now following him, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. So whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants, loses their life for me will find it. His kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom isn't built around self. It's built around him. And the wonderful thing is this, is that as self takes its place around him, we find we're released to be the people God's made us to be. Our calling is to live for him. So that first phrase, come, follow me, of discipleship, is then followed by, I will send you. I will send you, okay? I will send you, which picks up our value that actually is outgoing. So when we talk about outgoing, we're not talking about a personality type, okay? Just be super, super clear on this. We're not talking about my personal preference. Well, I prefer to be one that goes out and I prefer to say, no, it's not about that. It's about somehow it's reaching out with what God has put within us. Again, later, Jesus taught, in fact, it's Matthew 10. Jesus speaks to his disciples as he sends them out. He sends the 12 out for their first kind of 
outreach trip, their first going out together to actually do the kingdom stuff of praying for the sick uh, and bringing the good news to the kingdom. He sends them out and, and he sends them out with these words ringing in their ears. Freely you've received, so freely give. In other words, what God gives to us, we give. Because that reflects the heart of God. He's a giving God. And he's not just giving to us to bless us, although he does bless us. He wants to bless us, but he wants us to be a blessing to others. That we're like people packages, excuse me, people packages of the blessing of God, that we reach out, that we reach out with his grace. We receive his grace and we freely give it. We receive his love, we freely give it. We receive his mercy, we freely give it. We receive his compassion, we freely give it. That actually, there's a flow out. We reach out. That's why it's outgoing, not inward. That actually, that is to fuel us and to shape us and to be foundational to everything we do. It's why we are going to be you know, in town a bit later. It's why people got up early this morning and put up the marquee. It's because we want to be out in our community. It's why every week, you know, in terms of the church, there's all sorts of activities that happen that isn't just to keep us busy. It's not just to fill the program. It's not just so we look at, this is the program of King's Church Cockermouth. Don't we look good? It's not. It's to express freely we have received, so freely we give. And we give it by giving coffees. We give it by giving friendship. We give it at times by giving money. At sometimes we literally give food. Sometimes we give it by giving a listening ear. We're giving out. We're reaching out. Because Jesus said, I will send you. I will send you. It's so important we understand this in terms of self-denial. Again, some Christians can think that the, the goal of the Christian life is self-denial. You know, and they become experts at self-denial. There can be some church history stories. I could tell on that. You know, I sit on top of a pole in the most painful way for months on end. So I'm denying myself. Okay, it's there in church history. People did things like that. Now, I'm not, mocking, I'm not knocking devotion. But what we need to see with Jesus, self-denial is so that we deny ourselves to be part of a bigger picture than ourselves. And that's the good news. You see, self-denial is never the end game. It's a means to an end. Jesus, in fact, Jesus is the prime example of this. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He saw the joy of men and women, boys and girls, young people. He saw the joy. Every, everyone saved. That was the thrill. It was his ultimate self-denial was part of a bigger story. And so when, when, when we read about, or oh, deny yourselves, oh, there you go. It's just a bit, you know, you know, button up and close in, and, and I won't do that, because I'm, I, no, 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 no. Self-denial is about saying no to self, but yes to Jesus, knowing say yes to Jesus, it brings us into a bigger picture than anything we could dare imagine. And the bigger picture is this, is seeing Jesus change people's lives. It's about his kingdom come. So why are we holding on to this? No, I'm, myself is precious. Yeah, it is precious. God loves you. But don't serve self. Don't let self be your God. Let Jesus be your God. You can trust him. He loves you. He chose you. He knows everything there is about you. He's not put off by you. He thinks you're very special. Guess what? He came into your world. 
right into your boats in that smelly mess. That's where he came, right there. He met you right where you are. Right where you are. He says, come. I want a relationship with you. It's not about rules. It's about following him. And as we follow him, we find our life has a new trajectory. It has a new direction. That our life is now about giving out. It's about reaching out. I will send you. I will send you. I will send you. What does all this mean? I just want to kind of jump to the... Jono, can you just go to the you will send me? Okay, so we looked at come, I will send you. What does this mean? Just three quick points of application. Number one is this. Follow. That's simple. It's going to be three very, very simple words. Follow. Let's keep Jesus first. If you don't know Jesus yet, you can do. And you haven't got to go to the temple. You haven't got to go to the special place. You haven't got to go to the religious place. He comes to you. Receive him. But let's not settle. For those of us who know him, let's not settle for a bit of spirituality, a bit of churchianity, a bit, yeah, I kind of make room for that in my life. No, let's let Jesus be king. Let's, let, let's follow the king. Second word is to know. We're to know the king's calling. We're to hear, I will send you. We're to know the king's authority. He gave the disciples authority to pray for the sick. He gave them the authority to do the works that he did. Friends, we're growing in this. But let's grow in it. Let's step out with that authority. We have authority in the name of Jesus. We have authority. We don't just offer people good intentions. We offer them a good God. And we can do that with authority. The authority that comes from heaven. We serve people, but we say, in Jesus' name, give us the authority to see people's lives changed by the love and grace of God. We're called. Know that we're called to the big gospel story. Know that we have a promise of power in his life because we could hear all this and I'll send you. Yeah, yeah, okay, we go, we go, we go, we go. Actually, Jesus, at the end of the gospels in Luke, says, oh, Okay, before you go, wait. Because you will receive power from on high. And that's what we read about in Acts, Acts chapter 2. It was the day of Pentecost. God poured his spirit out that we might be witnesses to, that they might be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, to neighbours and nations. And then as they receive power and the power of the Holy Spirit, then Peter says, now this promise, Peter, we read about right back in Discipleship 101. He was there right by the boat. Now we hear him in the temple courts. And he said, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who God will call, for all of us. Right here, God says, I will clothe you with power so that you can go to neighbours and nations. Let's know it. Let's be filled with the Spirit. Let's hear it and receive it. That's how we reach out. Let's hear it, let, let's step out, but let's receive it, receive it, receive it. Say, God, fill me with your Spirit. Okay? If we only reach out without being filled, we will soon dr- dry up. Okay? It happens to the it happens to the most devoted 
sincere and diligent. They, they can just give, 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 give until there's nothing more to give. Now God wants to fill us and give. Fill us and give. Fill us and give. And sometimes we're giving, we're thinking, how come I've got energy for this when actually I was feeling so tired back then? How come? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever been in a situation, you're right, you think, oh, just haven't got the energy for it. But you kind of step into it and you find that somehow God meets you in it. It's the Holy Spirit. At work in us. Follow, know the king's calling, his authority, his presence, his power, his promise. And then lastly, reach out. Reach. Reach out with what God's put in you. Every single one of you here, every single one of you, God's put precious things in you. Freely you've received, freely give. Imagine if we view the whole of life with that calling. Think of your workplace. Think of your neighbourhood. Think of what's in your diary for this coming week. Just think. Freely I've received, now freely give. It's not that you pull up your soapbox and get on it in your workplace, in the coffee time, if you have coffee times at workplaces these days, at, at the coffee station, it's not that you stand up you know, next to the coffee machine and say, the kingdom of God is here. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> it may actually mean going to the coffee station, getting a coffee for someone who you find difficult to get on with. It's about reaching out with what God's put in you. But in that, God will give opportunities to talk about him. So we reach out in so many different ways. But in that, there will be those times. I didn't have to share this or not, but I will. Just to keep you interested. I, I, I was at an, I, I had an appointment this week, okay, with someone who was trying to help me, uh, help me overcome my injuries with running. Let's put it that way. And I was being rather, let's say, painfully manipulated. <laughs> let's just keep it simple without... You know, so in the stages of painful manipulation by someone who is somewhere in this, not in Cockermouth, but elsewhere in Cumbria, okay, is that broad enough and general enough? And do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, as I'm learning to breathe and not hold my breath, and as I'm learning not to make little boyish noises like <laughs> and little whimpers and things like that. I get the question, so tell me again about what you do do. <laughs> Which I kind of find is always an interesting question, you know, because many of you ask me that question, what do you do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> None of you are much wiser anyway. Yeah, but there's the question, well, what do you do? And so I go, so with measured breath, in a slightly high voice, you know, trying to be as relaxed as I can as different bits are being manipulated to different degrees. I, I do my best. <laughs> no answer. And then came the killer. I mean, literally, both ways. <laughs> and then the killer question. What is it about your job that gives you the most pleasure? I mean, what an unfair question. When you're there on the table, and you're, uh, 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 and go, uh, uh, no! I thought, what do I do? And, and you know, I, there could have been so many questions, so many answers, you know, oh, I don't know, but I can think, what, 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 what is it? 
And I thought, you know, I want to talk about Jesus. I could so easily churchify that question. But I thought, I want to talk about Jesus. And I said, do you know the thing? I think, <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> it, was, it was a humorous moment as well. <clears throat> but I said, I think the thing that thrills me the most is when I see people coming to know Jesus and growing in what Jesus has for their lives. That's, that's top. That's the kingdom. God gives opportunities. It's not soapbox opportunities, but we'll be with people. This week, you'll be with people. Let's talk about Jesus. But maybe it's not appropriate. If it's not, fine. Let's love people. Let's serve people. Let's show mercy to people. We're in a very divided, fractured nation at the moment. And I believe the church is in a unique place to reach out with an agenda that is not political, that is not partisan, but is kingdom. It's the kingdom of Jesus. And that's what God calls us to, be a people reaching out.